Hello everyone, welcome to our Bandside worship today as we continue to negotiate our way through this period of the coronavirus pandemic and as we continue to explore our identity in light of everything that is happening around us and more importantly, everything that we, the Bible teaches us and tells us. Now, it is with sadness and regret that I announce to you the passing of Mr. Samuel James Watt, Jim of 21 Brook Terrace. Jim passed away on Friday and his funeral service will take place later today. At this very hard time, we extend our deepest sympathies and our regrets to Jim's wife, Doreen, to his children, Samuel, Linda, Joanne, and David, and to the whole wider family circle. It is hard to believe, but this Wednesday coming will be Ash Wednesday, the start of our journey through Lent this year, a time we are offered as an opportunity to think again about who we are and how we're living, who we could be, and how we might take steps in that direction. As part of that journey, let me invite you to join our Lent Bible study. It's a six-part study which will begin this Wednesday and is entitled, Journey with Jesus This Lent, Prayer, Poetry, and the Presence of God. Each night, we'll reflect together on a passage of scripture and each night, We'll think about that passage in the context of two, I hope, arresting and accessible spiritual poems that I believe will shed new light on the passage and open new avenues of discussion about it. The meetings will all be by Zoom commencing at 8 o'clock. Further details of the study will be on our website and Facebook page and will be sent out to you on Bandside Buzz if you have shared your email address. I should say that all the poems we'll use are from a collection called Scratch the Surface by a fellow clergy person, a priest by the name of Eamon Kelly, whom I knew in Donegal. But today, on Valentine's Day, John, who meditated deep and long on all the levels and dimensions of love he could turn his mind to, calls us into worship saying, God is love, and everyone who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in them. John also powerfully reminds us, that God so loved the world that God sent God's one and only Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In a startling gem of insight, like light sparkling from the depths of a diamond, Paul perceives that there are three things that will endure forever. Faith, hope, and love, but that the greatest of these is love. And connecting this love to all the hardships of life and living, he asserts that he is convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor principalities, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Affirmed in that deep truth, we continue our worship of God in the hymn, Glory Be to God the Father.
now come into God's loving presence in prayer, let us pray. Lord God, loving God, as we approach Ash Wednesday and the start of our Lenten journey this year, work in the broken parts of our lives so that we see and understand reality more clearly, act more generously and justly, deepen our spirituality. Following the way of Jesus, bring us to new levels of light for our darkness, courage for our fear, hope for our despair, peace for our turmoil, joy for our sorrow, strength for our weakness, wisdom for our confusion, forgiveness for all our sins, love for our hates and prejudices. Take our old selves and twisted identities, straighten them, expand them, make them new. In the name of the Jesus who taught us to pray every day saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jane Scott will now bring us our reading. It begins at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, and it ends at Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. It says some pretty amazing things about aspects of identity. See what you make of it. Over to Jane. Paul speaks to us today and says, You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are descendants of Abraham and Sarah, and heirs according to the promise made to them. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he or she is no different from a slave, although heirs ultimately own the whole estate. But heirs are subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by their parents. So also, when we were under age, we were held in slavery under the deeply ingrained patterns and ways and forces of this world. But when the time had fully come, God sent Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive full rights as children of the family God. Because we are God's children, God sent the Spirit of Jesus into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but a child of God. And since you are a child of God, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to that which is not God. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Through this reading today, God wonderfully reminds us of our true identity. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now continue our worship as we sing the hymn, God is love, his mercy brightens all the path in which we rove. See 
And now, as we come to reflect on what God is saying to us today, through prayer, we open ourselves to God's voice in our ears, in our hearts, and in our consciences. Let us pray. Restless, loving, renewing God, in Jesus, you come among us to break down the barriers that exist between us in the human family in order to create a deeper level of solidarity and understanding. Speak to us today so that with one heart and one mind, through how we live, we may bear witness to the restored, reconciled, new humanity you are creating in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Since it's Valentine's Day, let me tell you a love story. It is a true story. It is not, however, what you would call a when Harry met Sally type love story, if you remember that old movie starring Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. It's not, to borrow the jargon, a rom-com, a romantic comedy. It intersects with too much harsh reality for that. It is, though, powerful and inspirational and moving. It lays bare how aspects of identity that people cannot change, that are simply part of who they are, can be used cruelly against them. Let's call our love story when William met Ellen, because that's what their names were, Ellen and William Craft. Ellen and William were deeply, deeply, deeply in love, but neither wanted to get married. It wasn't a commitment issue. It was rather a combination of previous bad experience, fear, and history. Ellen was raised by her mother, whom she adored. But aged 11, they were separated in a fashion devastating and traumatizing to both. William had gone through a parallel experience. His entire family, father, mother, sister, brother, had been scattered to the four winds. Besides, I should tell you, it was illegal for William and Ellen to be married. You see, this was Georgia in the deep south of the United States in the years before the Civil War. Ellen and William were slaves. So what were they going to do? How were they going to live out who they really were and how they really felt? Well, their love was powerful and true. So they celebrated what is called a slave marriage. That is, a marriage not recognized by the state, but validated by God and their community. Just after their marriage, William made a further proposal to Ellen. A bid for freedom. As Paul puts it in the wonderful and challenging letter written to the Galatians and to us. It is for freedom. Christ has set us free. And that desire for freedom was bubbling up in William's heart. Ellen, however, was afraid. There were so many tales of maiming and torture for those seeking to escape. But the call of freedom prevailed. They made their plans. And amazingly, it was now that a bitterly difficult dimension of Ellen's identity became the key which opened the door to the future. You see, although designated black, Ellen was light-skinned. Her father, as slaveholder and master, had owned her mother. She was one of his slaves, and he raped her. The slave owner's wife hated Ellen because she looked so much like her own children. 
So when Ellen was only 11, this slave owner's wife gave her away as a wedding present to one of her daughters who was moving a long way away. We can only imagine the heartbreaking parting of Ellen and her mother, the child's only protector in life. William had gone through something similar. All of his family had been sold off to different slave estates all over the place. And he, after that, vowed never to make such loving attachments again. But he did. For William met Ellen. The, the plan they devised to try to attain freedom, and with it, the opportunity to live out their full humanity was bold and it was risky and it was fearfully nerve-wracking. In it, they would always be hidden in plain sight. They would openly travel by train and by boat. And they would even stay in the same first-class hotels as strong advocates of slavery, such as John C. Calhoun, a former vice president of the United States. How could this scheme possibly be expected to work? Well, Ellen and William would travel as a couple. On account of her light skin, Ellen would be disguised as a sickly white man going north for medical care, accompanied by his male slave. That, of course, would be William. Ellen and William were challenged several times on their perilous journey. Gentle and shy by nature, Ellen had to learn to play the role of a dominant white male. Although it went against the grain, she also had to treat William like a slave. Eventually, as we might say, through many dangers, toils, and snares, they reached the prize of freedom. In so many ways, at this stage, Ellen and William just wanted to be left alone and raise a family in peace. But like Moses in his time, they could not forget their sisters and brothers left crying out through oppression. They became high-profile anti-slavery campaigners, playing their part in turning the tide on the brutality of that system. This carried its own dangers, as speaking out for justice and inclusion often do. In 1850, the U.S. Congress passed the absolutely scandalous, monstrous Fugitive Slave Act. It allowed owners of runaway slaves to send bands of slave catcher, catchers to recapture and re-enslave them. A squad of these slave catchers came after William and Ellen. But with the help of their friends, they escaped. They avoided them and went to Britain. Here, they continued their anti-slavery advocacy for the next 20 years. But the call of home was still strong. So even though they faced many terrors, they returned to Georgia. They established a school for folk formerly held as slaves. They were repeatedly attacked by the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, including having their school burnt to the ground. But they never gave in and they never gave up living out who they really were and resisting those who define them by only one aspect of their identity, the color of their skin, in order to exclude them from fullness of life and label them as inferior. Martin Luther King Jr. insisted that injustice anywhere 
is a threat to justice everywhere. We might extrapolate that exploitation and slavery anywhere are a threat to freedom and respect everywhere. Or that focusing on one strand of identity as a means of othering and excluding and dehumanizing anywhere are threats to understanding, inclusion, and human dignity everywhere. Where do you think the gospel stands on all of this? Well, in a powerfully visionary way, Paul insists that when anyone, anyone, anyone at all is in Christ Jesus, the old markers of identity in the world that we can so easily weaponize against one another are decommissioned. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Instead, there is a breaking down of ethnic sectarian barriers as we embrace our shared humanity in all of its diversity. There is neither slave nor free. Instead, there is an end to systems of domination as we seek the common welfare of all. There is neither male nor female. Instead, there is a radical rethink of deeply ingrained cultural and sexual norms as we reinterpret issues of gender, justice, and inclusion. Now, there is a lot in that. But if you are ever in circumstances in which some aspect of your identity is being turned against you in a demeaning or damaging or dangerous way, as a means of resistance, internalize the message of the African-American spiritual that gets to the heart of the matter and echoes Paul's reading to us today. It says, if anybody asks you who I am, who I am, who I am, if anybody asks me who I am, I'm going to tell them I'm a child of God. So if anybody asks you who you are and is putting you under pressure, just tell them that you are a child of God. That is your true identity. When William met Ellen, it's a love story for Valentine's Day. It absolutely is. But it's so much more. It's a parable of resistance and persistence, courage and commitment, hope and endurance. It's a poem about holding on to who you really are in the face of brutality and fear and attack. In following Jesus, may we live the same way. Amen. Let us pray. God of call and direction. Today, we pray for a new order in the world, one of energetic justice, peace like a river, and generous plenty. We pray for a new order in the church, one of unprecedented cooperation, amazing vision, and enduring mutual respect. And we pray for a, a new order in our lives, an order governed by your guidance in all we say or do. God of challenge and purpose, we pray also for a deeper faithfulness in the world so that the powerful may resist corruption. We pray too for a deeper faithfulness in the church that we may not be distracted from our task of loving and welcoming, helping and standing alongside others in every circumstance of life. And we pray for a deeper faithfulness in our lives, 
so that like trees planted by streams of living water, we may be rooted and grounded in you, yielding the fruit of the Spirit in due season. God in Jesus the Christ, who is our closest friend and our most insightful critic in all, we pray for the salvation of the world so that all creation may glory in you and sing your praise. And we pray for the church to be filled with your spirit so that who we truly are as human beings may be known. And each and every one of us may understand that we are children of God. So we pray for the grace to give ourselves more completely and more fully over to your care in order to grow into the people you would have us be. People building better relationships with those we view as foes. People blessing all our neighbors. People defending the image of God in others. People playing our part in tending the garden of shalom. People who have touched the hem of Jesus' robes. In his name we pray. And for his sake. Amen. And now we conclude our worship today in the wonderful hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
remember, if anybody asks you who you are, tell them you're a child of God. And through the work of the Spirit, in trust and in hope, in resistance to all that distorts and diminishes, embrace that message, sing that good news, celebrate that truth, walk in that light, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon us all and remain with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.